Let's kick off. So welcome everybody to Becoming Hybrid. Uh, one of the uh, one of the three conversations at the MA Innovation Management 2021 graduating class from Central St. Martins will be hosting with industry experts. Uh, my name is Rowan Wallace. I'm an uh, alumnus of MA Innovation Management, uh, graduated in 2017, and I'll be the host for today. Um, joining us today, we have industry expert Venkat Malik from Title Seven, and the graduates from this year's MA Innovation Management class, uh, Shivalika Tandon and Tina Zhang. The main theme from the MA Innovation Management 2021 uh, Graduate Showcase is Becoming. Uh, for this panel discussion, we'll be discussing how to become hybrid. We'll be uh, bringing in knowledge and experience from digital media, technology, design, uh, all to explore the real and the virtual. As, in, uh, uh, as innovation managers, we see becoming as an emergent force helping us to escape from rigidity and Im immobility. Throughout our learning progress, we've experienced the concept of becoming as a never ending flow that enables us to creatively imagine better futures. So, Let's get started with the panel introductions. Um, I'd like to um, start with inviting um, Shivalika, if you can introduce yourself, uh, your name, background, uh, and your research disciplines, please. Um, hi, my name is Shivalika Tandon. I am um, studying, my background is from communication design and economics. I have an interest in like business problem solving and I decided to study with Meme um, just to learn more about innovation and how to um, use my previous knowledge with um, trying to figure out other solutions in the world using design. Um, I worked with an advertising agency for two years before I joined this course and now I'm exploring um, female portrayal in the advertisement industry, specifically in India. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tina, and my background is interior design. And I joined innovation management because I'm interested in how to freshen up my background as a designer and to understand how design is able to link to other disciplines. And my research focus now is video games as well as the immersive technology that develop around it. Uh, next, I'd like to um, invite our industry expert, uh, Ben Kat Malik, uh, to introduce himself. Welcome uh, to this uh, panel discussion. And um, yeah, if you could uh, introduce yourself um, using, um, uh, let us know your name, your um, current role and responsibilities, and any uh, interesting work or projects that you have on the go. Yeah, it's so lovely to be here. And uh, yeah, so I've probably worked for longer than most of you have lived on this earth. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that's my first sort of point of distinction. Um, I've, uh, you know, I did a management uh, degree many, many years ago. And since then have been largely an advertising and marketing professional. Uh, I've worked with um, companies like J. Walter Thompson, uh, Leo Burnett, um, DD and Omnicom, Unilever, um, and a couple of others as well. Um, and uh, I now run um, a shop, a digital advertising shop that we started about four and a half years ago. Um, so now if you may, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting things that I've done, and I think that sort of um, uh, resembles some of the work that Tina is trying to do, is uh, I used to run an online game company uh, publishing MMORPGs um, into India at that point of time. It was part of a multinational company which was into gaming. <clears throat> and therefore, this entire debate of the real versus the real uh, in the context of uh, personas is a subject that, uh, in a sense, has been um, you know, that interesting thing that you were asking about um, in the middle of other, otherwise fairly sort of sedate advertising and marketing career. Fantastic. Welcome to this discussion. Um, fantastic to have um, a real mix of kind of different experience, um, you know, from, from a research perspective, from a, a practice 
perspective and uh, really looking forward to see, um, you know, some of the ideas that come out of this um, becoming hybrid sub theme. So yeah, uh, moving on to becoming hybrid, um, we're looking at blurring the boundaries between um, what takes place on and off screen as, as you've, uh, some of you have already mentioned, um, redefining uh, the moral morality of real versus real. Um, I think it's, it's a really kind of hot topic looking at the, the ethics um, behind it. Um, becoming hybrid uh, seeks to ask um, why it is important to create new hybrids and uh, creating new hybrids across disciplines leads to innovative practices. I'm, I'm curious to hear what is what does hybrid mean to you? Uh, in the most sort of potent way in the context of this part of the world. Um, so the word hybrid to me basically means like the offspring of basically two elements. So for example, we used to have the iPhone and a watch and Apple kind of created an Apple watch. So you're combining two different things to make something new and unique, which um, has different purposes all together. Um, in my research, I realized that just the combination of different thoughts and ideas also is some sort of hybrid. Um, speaking to people from different perspectives and changing people's viewpoints in some ways also creating a hybrid just because people are more welcoming to um, different opinions and thoughts than thus creating like different thoughts and opinions so i strongly believe like the change in the way people think is also trying to create a hybrid three words i write out for hybrid is mm -hmm. transdisciplinary imagination and uncertainty so it's about in the time of uncertainty how we are able to push the limit of our imagination as well as really practice that and make them out of take them out of the paper and then apply them into real life and then it's about stepping out to the safe zone that we are in and to expert, to be specialized in many things rather than one single thing. Yeah, absolutely. This transdisciplinary aspect to it um, is really kind of fascinating how um, moving from a kind of singular um, uh, discipline to not, not just necessarily two, but, but multiple. Um, really uh, yeah food for thought there coming from a gaming perspective um i guess um you probably have some some um perspectives on this as well uh venkat what 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 are your thoughts on uh real versus the real but i'll tell you the um, experiences that we sort of uh, uh, saw when we were going through this process of actually uh, almost creating the mmorpg market uh, in India and as well as in some other countries that the company used to operate out of. Um, the thing that we found, and you know, I'll tell you some human stories which will make it sort of interesting from, uh, and then we sort of, you know, expand that and talk about it in other, on, with, you know, to other dimensions. The one dimension we used to find, and I, you know, I don't know if, uh, if you are familiar with uh, this thing called the MMORPG. Uh, what that means is, um, what it stands for is a massively multiplayer online role-playing game, right? So the entire uh, concept of the MMORPG is that there are lots of maps where many avatars live, right? And they are sort of trying to win some battles, capture some mountains or whatever else, right? And there are various kinds of maps where you go and battle against your, your team battles against somebody else's team, right? And you sort of help each other and so on and so forth. So the, you know, so during this process, um, so they, 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 there's also hierarchy that gets created inside the game, right? So the hierarchy uh, is of people who are more powerful and less powerful. Right? And as it happens that, um, you know, the younger people are digitally more native and probably more adept uh, at gaming itself because they are born into it compared to some of the other people or learning, right? So the most powerful person in the game sometimes turned out to be the 11 year old meek looking guy. And he would be like the biggest kingpin inside that game, right? Or the uh, not so big 17 year old, right? And the game used to give those people the ability to live 
life as very powerful people right uh, and to me while you know one can sort of keep talking about real being good or you know real being good or whatever and the gap between real and real being you know should be the same or you know, should not be so much etc cetera, etc cetera. but i actually used to see that the people who were weak in real life found a great outlet outlet inside the game and they could be powerful even if for some time so they got a certain amount of psychological warmth out of it right uh, and therefore it sort of became an opportunity for them to suit themselves um you know in the middle of a fairly hard life otherwise maybe right which is what happens in india for example right so you know we are a we are a country full of uh, bollywood movies as you may be familiar right um bollywood movies are absolutely fictional right i mean nothing i mean i mean largely speaking you know most of those stories uh, are very unlikely to be true okay but the fact is that indians are crazy about it for example because they go there and they lose themselves into some fictional nonsense right but during those 3 hours they've forgotten everything that's rotten about their life right if all it is rotten right uh they've got themselves a bunch of joy they felt more powerful than they were they sort of you know relate to what the hero does on the screen and they think that they are they, they are the hero you know all of that kind of stuff which is really what happens inside a game um and therefore even for a moment um you know they actually feel so much better about themselves and i think that that can be a fairly soothing experience for people and in that context real versus real if there is a disconnect is brilliant no issue at all uh, but when real and real sort of start to become uh, you know where somebody is trying to cheat you by having a fake identity in the real right that of course uh, is unacceptable and so on absolutely i i think um there was a famous new york times cartoon with um one dog saying to another dog on the internet nobody knows that you're a dog and it's, it's the same sort of concept right so um i i think um um there's there is something fascinating about becoming um you know not um not just becoming um necessarily a hybrid and and although in most cases it will you will become some kind of hybrid of your your real self versus a fictional self um but um you know it 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 does kind of just open uh so many doors of of you know your your imagination of 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 you know your identity as well um and i think but as you've kind of rightfully pointed out um you know there are definitely there's ethical um concerns behind it too and and that require um the right sort of um governance over over that realm which um which is only just sort of starting to catch up i believe like i guess my opinion on real versus real is actually really different from the two that we've discussed because yeah. i feel like when you see something on screen um it has implications to your life obviously there are like some positive thoughts as well but sometimes i feel like when you see things on um your phone or on a big screen you tend to think that there that's what real life is when it may not be so i guess for some people it may make them more ambitious and want them to work hard to try to achieve um that life that they're seeing on screen but then there are also other people who um tend to live in this like make believe world where it doesn't necessarily um affect them in a positive way it has like a negative impact on them um for example just to just because it relates to my research um since i'm talking about like women portray a female portrayal in the media so i feel like so many times you see like females portrayed as um like a housewife or like a mother um those are the roles that she's seen as so as a society you sort of think that these are the only roles that women are supposed to be seen in um so i guess like what you see on screen also molds society and has an effect on like the thoughts and processes which sometimes can be a positive thing but sometimes it can also be a negative thing absolutely absolutely i think there's a, there's a lot of kind of mindfulness that goes into it and also that maybe not not everybody it's maybe not a one size fits all as well right definitely um, 
Fantastic. So, I mean, I think we started um, sort of touching on the, the next question a little bit. Um, so this is around kind of looking at this sort of com conflicting situation that we're in, um, you know, with regards to the differences between reality and virtuality. So um, should we stay on you, Shivalika? Um, do you have any, any, any thoughts on this? Uh, what do we, how do we kind of manage this, um, you know, this kind of co conflict between these two sides? Um, I think slowly, like it's, as much as it's like as nice as it is to have this different like avatar online um to make maybe make you feel powerful in that moment um as long as it's not affecting um negatively impacting like your day-to-day -day life in like reality that's fine but like i feel there should be um a more balance and like equal um or like reality and virtuality should like come closer together because right now i think that the gap is really really big you can be practically anyone you want online there's so many for example there's so many dating apps where people put like have fake profiles and then people get catfished so i feel like stuff like that isn't necessarily like a good thing from having from being able to have a different identity online as compared to a different identity in real life so i feel like we should slowly try to um, get them closer together and not and like slowly try to bridge the gap and not have the gap be so large. Interesting. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, I, I really would be super interested to see how, uh, what the sort of steps that we could take as a, as a species as, and as a society to kind of make that happen. Um, so Tina, should we go to you? Um, what, what's your take on this question about um, this conflicting situation between reality and virtuality. In the content of the persona that being constructed online, there are two level of uh, there are two level that we are um, saying here. So there are two presenter of the persona. Like there's one level on a personal level. So we like like the fake profile. So in order to attract um, more people through the dating app, we provide a fake perfect version that we know everyone gonna like online. And then there are also the organizational or the social level of uh, presenter of the persona, like during the um, an advertisement where a woman is portrayed to be, let's say, to be slim, to be, um, to have a perfect body shape. So that's really, um, that's really a social and cultural issue that we are talking about here. So I think I, I really don't know how to deal with the bigger problem like the organizational and the social cultural problem. But in terms of the personal problem, I think there is a positive side that uh, we can take on. Any thoughts on that um, from your side, Ben Kat? Yeah, so I'm, I'm just sure, you know, obviously there are lots of uh, bad sides to um, having a fake profile, right? And, and I guess all of us know that. And definitely dating sites are a favorite subject uh, where sort of people take you for a ride, literally, right? Uh, that said, I'm trying to figure out if there are good sides to it, right? And I, I personally feel that, um, um, you know, and you know, I'm going to go back to my gaming experience because that's really where I learned something about that. Um, it is that, you know, you know, all said and done, there are lots of sides to people, uh, lots of unexpressed, um, unexplored parts to people's personality, their skills, their everything, right? So, for example, you know, I've sort of um, always wanted to sing songs, right? Never had the confidence. I'm going and learning singing now at like a fairly ripe old age. Um, and the thing is that um, uh, it's an unexpressed side of me, right? And if uh, I'm among people I know, I feel shy and I can't do it. But if I'm among, amongst strangers, I'm cool, right? Uh, I'm able to sort of sing without really batting an eyelid, right? Uh, and I feel, therefore, that the internet, with its possibility of allowing you to create various kinds of avatars and personas, as long as it's not done with the intention of harming, hoodwinking, etc., is perfectly fine. I would count it towards the self-expression, right? Um, you know, if, for example, in a in a twenty-year-old, you know, if two decades ago if you were part of the LGBT community, right? Anywhere in the world for that matter, right? What would you do? 
I mean, you wouldn't be able to say this in public, right? I mean, you would want to hide that and so on and so forth. Today's, you know, today's things are a lot you know, different uh, in many, many countries, not in all countries, right? But 20 years ago, it would have been extremely difficult for you to express yourself. So what do you do, right? Do you live that repressed life and sort of bury yourself in the end? Or do you find channels through which you can express yourself, right? Digital avatars might be a way of doing it. And I would, I would think that there is a positive side uh, to some of that, as long as it's not done with malintent, you know? So if you're faking it and you want to cheat somebody, of course it's wrong. And all of us know that, right? But if that is not the intention, um, you know, maybe you can sort of go out and you know, create an avatar and say, I'm part of the LGBT community. And you might just bump into somebody right over there, but you may not be able to do it in real life. Right. So, I mean, some of those things can actually be fairly positive um, as long as, you know, and all of us agree that if it's malintent, then of course it's not acceptable. Um, but who decides like who's supposed to be held accountable? So that's why, like, cause I feel like the internet and like this online space is um, one, it's such a large space where um, like, I constantly question like who's supposed to be accountable for other people's actions, who's responsible for that? Because with what's happening around us, obviously like the, you can't make the individual making these decisions, um, you can't hold them accountable. So how are we gonna work about that? Because I definitely feel like someone has to take responsibility. And at this point, not necessarily, like there isn't some, individual or space or people who are um taking responsibility i think uh i think that you know living in a, in a global connected world as you say there are so many different um inputs into our global culture as a society and um you know then it, it really does kind of it starts becoming this debate about um you know and, and and exactly what we're talking about where the responsibility lies um, whether that's on on the end user, whether that's on the the platforms in terms of mediation, etc., whether it you know goes up to a government level, and I think this whole kind of ethical um, moral debate around um, you know real versus real is is really fascinating, and it's it's yeah. probably going to take a, a long time for us to to figure it out. But um, I, I want to ask Tina, you know, do you feel that? That that the that these kind of um, concepts of of ethics of you know between the uh, real R E A L versus real um, are are these things that we can actually define as kind of like fixed concepts? I was just thinking about it. I just feel like there are already some sort of like ethics and like some sort of rules already there for what's what we put out on the internet. For example. Um, like when you're with your group of friends in real life, you may make like a racist joke or something that is inappropriate, but you would not say the same thing online just because one, it's out there forever. Two, um, it, multiple people have access to it and can react to it in different ways. So I do think for the most part, before posting stuff online and putting themselves out there, people do think about what they're putting Obviously, this doesn't apply to everyone, but um, for the majority of people, especially people who have like a voice, like influencers or politicians, not including Trump, but most other people. So, yeah, I'm curious. I mean, what do you think, um, you know, just kind of taking that point, um, you know, starting from um, just, you know, saying and uh, uh, making a, say, politically incorrect um, statement online, you know, and, and, and kind of extrapolating that to, you know, having this whole, um, you know, a virtual persona online versus um, offline? Um, I think, well, some, there are two different sides to this. Um, one side is that you would want to be neutral when you're online, just because you don't want to have, get trolled by people or have extreme opinions, because you don't want to take a side. Um, also, sometimes being Switzerland is easier and safest. But at the other side, because it's online and people aren't um, 
they have a louder voice online. So I feel like when they say something um, that's e- e- extreme, it's one able to reach more people than if they were supposed to just say it from like to everyone they physically know. Um, it sometimes has a larger impact when it's said online as compared to when it's said in real life, but also that there's this other aspect of being anonymous. You don't have to disclose exactly who you are when you make a statement online. Like you can be an absolute nobody, make a massive statement and it's going to affect other people, but you have the safety of being anonymous. Um, so fascinating. So you almost have this polarizing effect where some people are, um, you know, try, very politically correct. They don't want to offend anyone. They don't want to. Um, it's almost a kind of um, um, sort of neutralizing effect because people are too scared to 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 offend others or they or to to get a bad reputation. And I also feel like they do that. Sometimes it's they do that online just because yes, like you said, they don't want to get a bad reputation, etc. But what they personally feel, like in their personal thoughts, may actually differ and maybe are extreme, but they don't want to put that out there to share with everyone. Like that may be a private and personal thing. Please. There's, also the, there's also the force of censorship. So there are different rules for censorship in different countries as well as on different platforms. So, uh, so if I follow one person on different platform, you are able to see that how he has or he or she have a different persona across different platform because the censorship rules is different. So we are kind of shaped into a, per, a certain persona because we because of the uh, digital environment that we are in. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the censorship um, does play a huge part and, and, and it kind of relates back to the, the point um, around kind of just demarcating different arenas for different purposes, right? So it kind of makes those different space. It could, it could actually assist rather than limit um, in kind of creating the right environment for the right kinds of um, conversations, for example. Also responsibility. I feel like that's in one way, someone taking responsibility by going over the content, I guess, that you post online, or um, it's creating rules and regulations, which in a way is taking responsibility. Sure. I think, um, you know, in terms of um, moderation and expression on the internet, it's, it's a huge debate, isn't it? I mean, the way that it was kind of initially created was um, to kind of avoid um, censorship, to promote free speech, etc. But it's almost kind of um, done, done a 180 uh, in, in the last kind of few years. So probably bringing some, some more of that into it and finding that right balance is, is going to be key. Um, I want to move on to the next question. And this is all about kind of um, being transdisciplinary. So we, we kind of touched on it before. I mean, obviously being a hybrid is, is kind of fusing um, different, um, different elements, um, um, you know, of your um, say identity, spe- specifically if we're talking about, um, you know, um, uh, personas and online and offline. So um, w- I want to kind of bring it back to the real world a little bit and, and look about at this trend of being transdisciplinary within business. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of, um, you know, um, job titles talking about, you know, working in um, cross, cross-functional teams, being multidisciplinary, especially you know, um, start the startup culture, for example. Um, I want to um, go go to Ben Cap first and understand um, what do you think about this idea of, of being transdisciplinary? Um, you know, a, as a kind of um, a proponent in in innovation in in, in the business world uh, today. What is that? What's your sort of take on that? Um, as a successful kind of um, business owner. Yeah, absolutely. So, in fact. Um... <clears throat> So one of the things that the um, uh, advertising industry prides itself about, right, is um, is our ability to bring what's called cross-market knowledge. Yeah. Uh, what that means is that you apply the learnings from one industry onto another, right? And very often, uh, people in one industry aren't thinking the way the other industry does when actually there could be various synergistic ideas that you can bring from one to the other, right? 
And because of the fact that as advertising companies, we work with many, many, many different categories and brands over the time that we actually spend in the, in the business, right? Uh, we're able to actually make that happen, right? Because we learn from one place, teach another, right? Um, and our ideas actually travel. They travel industries, they travel brands, they travel geographies, etc. cetera. Um, and that sort of brings us back to this point about transdisciplinary, right? So, um, you know, what, what that also means is not being siloed. And actually the learnings of one discipline do teach you something that you can apply to another discipline that you learn as well, right? And so people who are able to bridge more than one discipline are more likely to knit the pieces together and create a new future uh, than people who are stuck inside the silo. I mean, obviously that's a, uh, a, a statement of what you would call it opinion, right? But uh, chances are, if there has got to be a large scale progress, it's gonna be through people who can actually see the pieces in multiple places and bring them together. And then I'm um, gonna go to Tina next um, question. And um, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, transdiscipl being transdisciplinary on an individual level. And there's a kind of, there's been a debate around, you know, um, specialization versus um, being, you know, transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, or kind of, um, you know, something in between. What, uh, what do you think that we should kind of, focus on and, and, you know, should we become more transdisciplinary or, or more specialized or something, something in the middle? I like the idea of specializing into something because it requires patience and then dedication into one single subject. And then we don't really do that often right now. But then I guess if we want to be innovative, we have to learn how to be transdisciplinary because, um, because when we are keep repeating the same thing, although we can learn from it, it's really hard to be creative. There's only so far you can go. So once you are able to merge different things together, you are more likely to sell your products or your services. I feel there's maybe also um, some, um, you know, some, some businesses are kind of um, branching out and becoming more transdisciplinary in certain ways, say for example, using the, the software, new software or tools or digital services, but then becoming very um, focused and specialized in say their product. So maybe you are, um, you know, a, a restaurant business and you've focused just on doing one thing really well, but you have amazing kind of um, different uh, delivery service options behind it. So there's kind of ways that you can kind of be specialized and transdisciplinary at the same time, potentially. So um, last big question. So is it important to create new hybrids? And if so, why? Um, I can start. I definitely think it's important to create new hybrids um, because the world around us is constantly developing, changing for, I hope, for the better. And there's so much more competition. So I feel like in order to not only survive, but also thrive. You need to um, be able to collaborate with other people You need in order to innovate. So in my mind, that sort of creating, constantly creating new hybrids. Um, you, when you do like, of course, specialization is, it's, I think it sounds really good on paper, but I also feel that you need to be open to change so that the job that you're doing today, for example, um, you have to think that, is it going to be the same? Are you going to have the opportunity to do the same job 15 to 20 years down the line? Will you still be relevant there? Will you be needed then? Because if the world constantly changing with technology constantly changing, um, the same jobs are not always there. Like they're constantly developing and they're more different. They're different requirements. So I feel like you should be open to change and, um, because of that, it's important to create new hybrids. I, I was just thinking that I feel like there are two types of hybrids. One is more related to transdisciplinary, where you are actually like on a personal level, I actually know 
I know graphic design, I know interior design, so I can do you know both the interior and the branding for a new restaurant, so stuff like that. And then there is another. I don't know that it's the right word, but it's a more superficial kind of hybrid. So that will relate to the platform economy that uh, we once talked about during class. So where we actually provide a platform for people to come in rather than we are being transdisciplinary our, ourselves. We, pro we provide a place for a hybrid. So for example, WeChat, WeChat had this, um, so WeChat is basically China's uh, WhatsApp. And then it has this, um, function where it's called mini programs. So basically on our app, uh, on our phone, we have a lot of apps. Like we we pay for del uh, delivery, we, we purchase um, stuff from supermarket and stuff like that. But then with the mini programs, um, all this app is able to have a mini app inside of the uh, WeChat app <laughs> so that we can just basically do everything on one with one single app. Yeah, so I've, I'm, I've just been thinking about it because you, uh, you know, all of you are touching upon dimensions of it, which are very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, one of the things that I was wondering about, so for example, who's more likely to find a cure for cancer or the next level of cancer, right? The person who goes deep or the person who does some hybrid vibe. So the thing is, I think for us to make progress as a world, right? Uh, you need to have the ability to cross-link patterns from different parts of the world, different industries, etc., which is what we are referring to as hybrid, right? But you also need those people who are going to dig deep into one molecule, right? And figure out nuances of it so that it solves. I I'm sure you need to be transdisciplinary even there, right? Because you can sort of apply cancer drugs for COVID treatment right now, right? For example, I mean, you know, so I'm not sort of going against this thing called transdisciplinary. But the thing is that the depth of work that you need to do as a researcher to find a cure for something, right? Which obviously changes the world in a very, very significant and positive manner, right? Is as important as the ability to do an Uber or an Airbnb where you've just been smart, right? Because you created a software that linked all those people who worked really hard to build up their hotels or whatever they built up, right? So who added more value? The guy who put up the hotel or the guy who created the software? If you look at it from a world point of view, I don't know the answer. The guy who put, you know, Airbnb, the owner of Airbnb or the owner of Uber obviously made a lot of money, right? Compared to the guys who actually put the hotels up. But, uh, you know, if you look at it from a world point of view, who added more value? The guy, obviously, who goes in and builds, I mean, finds the cure for cancer, adds a lot more value, right, than the guy who makes money on it. It's like, you know, for example, there are farmers, and this is a debate we've had, right? The people who make the most money on tomato, for example, are the people who bid on futures for tomatoes, right? Because they know what's happening in different markets in different countries and so on and so forth. And they know that the prices are going to go up or whatever, and they make bets on it. The person who makes the least amount of money is the farmer. And if the farmer didn't work really, really hard, we wouldn't be eating the tomato. So, you know, somewhere along the line, while hybridization is obviously smart and it's great and it's innovative and it's uh, progressive on one dimension, right? There are other dimensions of progress that you need in the world, right? So I maybe, you know, I just, I was just thinking of it while you were sort of saying that. So maybe there is real progress and for real progress, you also need depth. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I was just thinking of it while you were sort of talking about it. I felt Absolutely. that, yeah. It, and Tina sort of touched upon that, right? So that, that the need for depth is as important as uh, the need for hybridization or just being transdisciplinary. Um, I've forever been transdisciplinary or whatever. What does innovation mean to you and your work? Um, just at a, you know, very sort of, um, you can go as general or as, as, as kind of specific as you like. Um, I think let's stay with you, Venkat, since you kind of, you know, also, um, you know, you're, you're, you just kind of discussed a little bit about this transition, um, you know, between different types of media, but at a, you know, what, what, what is innovation? You know, how do you kind of define it and how is it sort of a, a, applicable to, to your everyday work? 
It actually applies in many different ways. But I mean, just as a conceptual thing, innovation to me is uh, the process of actually being future ready. Um, and, you know, just as a summary sort of definition of it. Uh, otherwise, I mean, you know, a, a, you know, digital is really at the, what you would call it, you know, the, the, the business that's seeing the largest amount of change at some level, right? Um, and as a result of which, uh, you know, you're constantly seeing new things coming in at every point of time, right? Um, there is, uh, you know, AI and there is IoT and there is blockchain and uh, everything has some implication or the other uh, on the business and the way uh, you could use it uh, to one, do your sort of your, um, your own role better, play your role better, uh, as well as to serve people better, right? I mean, um, uh, you know, fundamentally one is to serve clients, the other is to serve consumers and people, which are the two aspects to our business constantly. And, uh, you know, all of these kinds of new technology help us uh, to perform our role better in both these contexts. Um, innovation to me basically means uh, like using new methods to um, change and change for the better. Uh, in terms of my work, I feel I'm really interested in um, business problem solving through design. So I just feel like it's essential to be innovative over there um, to add value to your work. So thinking of new um, possibilities and like new methods of fixing a solution um, using the least amount of money and um, just like being a set, like figuring out how you can be most essential and effective to um, your client. What is constantly in a state of becoming? Coming from my personal point of view, uh, first of all, my design, my perspective in terms of what design really means and what designers role lies is constantly changing and it's constantly becoming because it's going to change after I don't know, a few years. So I guess, yes, it's just how becoming really means to me. So it's about changing your perspective and not just change it, shift it, but to add new things into it. Yeah. So everything actually about digital marketing is constantly in a state of becoming. And I guess all of you would agree with that, right? Um, so there is um, new, uh, new, new ways. So people are constantly changing as well, right? So. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, driven by the fact that um, people, their relationship with the world at large, their relationship with uh, digital media, right? Um, the experiences that uh, lots of companies are delivering to them, uh, which, um, you know, keeps putting pressure on everybody else. Like, for example, consumers learn from Amazon and then they demand that or that kind of service of everybody else, right? And I'm sure you guys must have heard about that particular thing. So um, I think uh, consumers are changing all the time. So they keep putting pressure on the business uh, or on marketers, if you may, uh, to actually evolve at every point of time. Um, technology is changing. Social media is changing, whatever. I mean, you know, uh, honestly, everything is just constantly in a state of becoming, if you may. I think both Venkat and Tina have like really summed it up really well. But I also believe that like everything around you, like people, um, you individually, and like the world around you is constantly in a state of becoming. Um, because in order to move forward, like you need to be open to change. And just because everything on like a daily basis is constantly changing and evolving. And if you don't, and if you aren't in a state of becoming, you're going to fall back and be left behind. So I feel like with how competitive everyone is around us in order to like succeed and be successful, um, we're all constantly in a stage of becoming. Fantastic. And I think that's a really good conclusion. Thank you very much to everyone. I think we've had a really rich discussion today. Um, I want to thank you for joining the Becoming Hybrid uh, discussion panel and, you know, wish you, uh, you know, uh, all the best for your journey um, in becoming hybrid. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us and Thank also you. to the um, graduate students from MA Innovation Management, Shivalika and Tina. Thank you so much. And for myself, Rowan, thank you so much for having me.